Hi, I'm Dr. Tim Kosinski from Detroit, Michigan area. And today's program is setting the foundation for emergence profile and smile design. Very important concepts in modern implant dentistry. Physically placing the dental implant or the fixture in available bone um, is not the most challenging aspect of implant dentistry today. Rather, understanding tooth position, I like to call it a tooth up or tooth down, uh, understanding of the process is most critical. And that will help us to create emergence profile and smile design for our patients, which is expected uh, by the public today. So what are our learning objectives today? Our learning objectives is we're going to briefly talk about what I refer to as atraumatic extraction techniques. Um, sometimes critical, criticized for using that term, but let's call it minimally traumatic extraction techniques. And what I mean by that is removing teeth and maintaining as much bone as possible, especially the facial plate, if that's possible. Um, also atraumatic or minimally traumatic to the patient. If the patient can have a positive extraction um, experience, that is a great marketing strategy. Uh, we all know those patients that have had extractions that are traumatized to a high degree. And then finally, atraumatic or minimally traumatic to me, the practitioner, trying to save your hands, your arms, your shoulders, your eyes, your ears are very important parts of dentistry today. We're going to talk about some predictable grafting of three and four wall defects. And what I mean by that is three wall, meaning where the facial plate is missing. We can we can predictably grow a facial plate of bone fairly routinely in our practices. A four wall defect, I'm going to refer to that as a socket site where all the walls are intact, including the facial plate. We're going to discuss in pretty good detail, single tooth replacement to all the way to a full arch implant retained prosthesis fabrication that I think will be helpful uh, in your daily practices to help you become very, um, efficient and proficient in your techniques. So let's go right into the clinical aspects. We have a tooth here that is deemed non-restorable. We have an abscess, a root canal treated teeth with uh, a post in it, probably a horizontal fracture. I don't know how your practices are, but we are seeing so many patients come in with uh, fractured teeth, especially root canal treated teeth ever since COVID. I think the stresses of daily life are, are really affecting people. So we have a tooth that needs to be extracted. We have a post, we have a horizontal fracture at that post line, creating a significant uh, abscess or infected site. We must remove this tooth uh, for the health of the patient. So again, we're going to determine the best technique to remove this tooth. Um, what we will do is I will anesthetize the area. I won't necessarily block uh, in my, my situations. I will infiltrate uh, in the vestibule and do a PDL around this tooth. So we're not necessarily numbing the whole area, nor is it necessarily uh, needed to do that. I then take a periotome and I'm just checking for, I'm checking for uh, proper anesthesia. Make sure the patient doesn't feel anything more than just a little bit of pressure. Uh, in this situation, because the tooth uh, has a, a fairly large abscess, I'm going to go ahead and just use a conventional cow horn. Um, but the techniques with our extractions are, are very, very simple and predictable. Now, we are going to squeeze the cow horn into the furcation area. And the way a tooth is extracted is to break down the periodontal ligament. So creating tension on that root structure will result in a physiologic reaction of the body, uh, of the area. An enzyme will be released, which will melt away the periodontal ligament. And what's holding this tooth in position? The periodontal ligament. So what I will do is I will take my cow horn and I will rotate my wrist here lingually uh, and hold it till 10. I'll actually count to 10. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Then I will release and then go towards the facial or the buckle. And again, count to 10. Now I may need to do this several times, but the, the enzyma, enzymatic physiologic reaction will break down the periodontal ligament and I'm able to remove this tooth relatively atraumatically or minimally trauma, traumatically for the patient. The patient isn't experiencing a lot of pressure or, um, or symptoms. 
The most important part following an extraction is to evaluate the socket site. And to do that, we must curette the site. We must remove any granulation tissue uh, from the socket sites. Purple blood is bad, red blood is good, but you have to feel comfortable really aggressively curetting the site, removing the granulation tissue, which in this situation is very, very significant. You can see the big bolus of granulation tissue. Again, bleeding is good. And then I always, always take a radiograph following an extraction. I wanna ensure that there's no root tips. We see that a lot in dentistry. Um, doctors are leaving root tips because taking teeth out is, is hard. It's, it's, it's a challenging, um, it's a challenging technique oftentimes. So take a radiograph, make sure that the tooth is removed in total. There's no root fragments there. And we're going to evaluate the site. So what happens with bone loss? We know when we remove a tooth, bone is going to shrink. It's going to shrink down and in, in the lower jaw, up and in, in the upper jaw. In the posterior uh, maxilla, uh, the tooth roots act like a tent pole holding up a circus tent. And what happens to that circus tent if you remove the tent pole? It will collapse. And that's the challenging part for many of us uh, doing implant dentistry today. Our limitations are the size of the maxillary sinus. We don't have enough viable bone to predictably place an implant or to comfortably place an implant. And in the mandibular posterior area, we're concerned with the position of the mandibular nerve or the mandibular canal. When we lose teeth, bone is going to shrink in several dimensions. Our denture patients, as you know, will continue to lose bone without any kind of stimulation. And sometimes we will get dehiscence of the mental foramen resulting in paresthesia or even discomfort when the patient is chewing. When we lose teeth, Oftentimes the face will collapse, resulting in diminished aesthetic features of the face. The nose gets longer, the chin gets wider, that typical witch's chin um, look. <clears throat> so grafting at the time of extraction is critical. Uh, if I'm extracting a tooth, I am always grafting that site. Even if the patient elects not to have uh, an implant or prepare for an implant in the future. Um, grafting at the time of extraction will help prevent bone loss will support the soft tissue architecture. It'll help minimize or prevent periodontal pathology, and it will provide an adequate site for implants in a short three to four months, uh, three, three to four week, um, <laughs> three to four months or 12 to 16 weeks. So it's important that we explain and educate our patients on why grafting is important. It's an important part of what we do in preparation for future dental implants. Without grafting, we know we will get soft tissue infiltration. Epithelium grows up to 10 times faster than bone. And the socket will fill in with epithelium and you'll get that, that horse's saddle look or worse, will get collapsed. And we've all seen that in our practices. We'll lose ridge height and width. And the literature will say that in a three-year period, we can lose up to 30 to 60% of, of the bone in an area, which is significant. If we lose that bone, we extract teeth, we don't graft and we lose that bone, the patient may need a future grafting procedure that may be much more invasive and much more expensive, taking bone from the, from the ramus or from the um, symphysis area. Oftentimes, many of us, we understand that we take teeth out and we wanna graft, but sometimes we go back and the material didn't convert to natural bone. Um, it's mushy, it's soft, and that's very frustrating. Why would a socket graft fail? Well, there's a number of reasons. The wound could open, um, and so suturing techniques are very critical to maintain the graft into the site, regardless of what material that we're using. Um, if we're using an allograft material, um, it's very critical that we protect that allograft from invagination of epithelium. Again, physiologically, any socket site is going to heal from the apex towards the crest, and epithelium is going to go from the crest towards the apex. If epithelium grows faster, it's going to cause a problem. So we must, must protect our graft material from invagination of epithelium. Infective environment is very important. You must curette and contaminate, decontaminate the area 
Um, and if you don't, the graft may not uh, integrate, uh, resulting in failure. Bone characteristics, all skeletal bone demonstrate volume stability over time, except of course, where we're working, the dental alveolus. Why? Because the dental alveolus is very labile in the absence of loading. We understand that with our denture patients. We fabricate a, a, a plastic or acrylic uh, denture base over time, that patient needs to have a reline. Did the plastic change or did the underlying bone change? So we understand without stimulation of that bone, that uh, important bone structure is going to shrink over time. There are a ton of grafting materials out there. Autographs obviously are the gold standard, the patient's own patient, uh, own uh, material, own uh, bone building materials. Allograft are uh, from another human source and we can have mineralized or demineralized. The demineralized, we have inorganic um, minerals are removed, leaving organic collagen matrix, which exposes more bone morphogenic proteins. Demineralized allograft will get a little bit faster conversion. Uh, the downside of it is radiographically, it's very uh, radiolucent and difficult to, to see a changeover. Xenograph, I don't use xenograft uh, in, in my practice. It is a excellent material for holding a site to building, but in my opinion, it is not a good material for as a future, as a uh, substructure for a future implant placement. Um, it doesn't bleed. The, the particulate is very hard and it isn't resorbed. Alloplastic material, I've used in my career, just about every alloplastic material from, from um, uh, glass beads to hydroxyapatite, tricalcium phosphates. He started off with plaster of Paris. And a lot of them, these materials just did not work or were not predictable. We need predictability in our dental implant procedures today. Uh, one of the materials that I will discuss uh, today is called osteogen. It's a bioactive calcium apatite material, synthetic material made in a laboratory in a bovine Achilles tendon matrix. That bovine Achilles tendon matrix is a binding agent. Uh, and with this alloplastic material, we don't need a membrane to prevent invagination of epithelium. And we'll discuss that in a few moments. So uh, there's different kinds of membranes available, uh, resorbable membranes. Um, I like to use a three or four month resorbable membrane. It's purified intact collagen from porcine peritoneum. It's very easy to maintain and control. The key with our membranes are two. Number one, the membrane must be placed passively. It must remain intact for at least six weeks. So if we're using an allograft material, the membrane must extend at least two millimeters beyond any defect. It must be passively placed, and it's imperative that it remain intact for at least six weeks. In those situations, I can very predictably tell you that you are going to grow bone. You can grow a facial plate. Um, our mineralized allograft blend materials, our cortical cancellous, what I use, it's osteoconductive for rapid site revascularization and stru structural in integrity. These are simple procedures that each and every one of you listening can, um, can incorporate into your practices and feel very comfortable that you are going to grow bone in a very short amount of time. The osteogen plug is the second material that I use in my practice. It's an alloplastic material. It's a homogenous mixture of osteogen graft crystals and bovine Achilles tendon collagen. It's a combination of this bioactive crystal particulate bone graft with purified collagen. The goal here is to make socket preservation easy and affordable. It's a very inexpensive material, but it does grow bone predictably. The key benefit obviously is easy and effective and you don't need a membrane. So we're not investing in a membrane. Doctors, I do a lot of implants. And it's a very important part of my practice. Implants is probably the most financially rewarding thing that you can do in your practice. So preparation of any site is critical. Um, oftentimes our grafting procedures are not covered by dental insurance. So you have to educate and instruct your, your patients on the benefits and the importance of this simple procedure. 
Building the bone up, allowing the, the bone to heal will give you a predictable site for future implant placement. But obviously the, the limiting factor may be the cost. Um, all our patients are on a budget of some sort. And so you have to decide what's in the best interest for your patients and work within their budget. So going back to the, the case, we have a site and I reflected the, the, the tissue. Um, my reflections are very, very simple. I try not to make vertical incisions into mucosa. Rather, I will do what I refer to as an envelope reflection, meaning going around the teeth and simply taking a number 10 envelope and blowing into it. If I do not incise into mucosa, I will not get prostaglandin and histamine release. It's easier closure of the site and our post-operative discomfort is minimal. If you incise into mucosa, the patients are going to hurt, they may bruise. And so my protocol is to do what we refer to as an envelope reflection. You can see that there is a little bit of a facial defect in this area. And my rule of thumb, my humble rule of thumb is if all the walls are intact for wall defect, I will use this osteogen alloplastic material without a membrane. It's a very cost-effective uh, material to use. If the facial wall is missing greater than five millimeters, then I will use an allograft and I will use a membrane. That membrane is passively placed and positioned at least two millimeters beyond the defect. And it must remain intact for at least six weeks. So suturing is very important. Here, I've taken the osteogen plug, the alloplastic material, and I'm simply going to carefully place it into the socket site with a condenser. I'm not crushing it, and I wanna place this material above the crest, even to the tissue level. Again, I will use this material routinely if my facial defect is five millimeters or less. You can see the position, uh, eliminate the excess blood with a sterile gauze. I'm evaluating the soft tissue. We must have a band of attached gingiva on the facial aspect of all our implants. It's a very critical part of our implant success today. So I can clearly see that I do have uh, attached gingiva on the facial aspect, but now my suturing technique has to maintain that attached gingiva on the facial aspect of the implant. So I don't need primary closure. I don't want primary closure. Physiologically, epithelium will grow a half a millimeter to a millimeter a day. So even though this is a very large defect, in a very short amount of time, a week, 10 days, maybe up to two weeks, that epithelium will grow over the top of this alloplastic material and we will get primary closure. So my suturing techniques, as I mentioned, is very precise and very, very um, um, consistent. Most of us learn to, to suture. We, in dentistry, we use reverse cutting needles and we will go from facial to lingual in this situation. The problem with that technique is if we do have a membrane, let's say we use an alloplastic material and put a membrane, it is not difficult to engage that membrane. And then when we bring the patient back to remove the sutures, the membrane is dislodged or pulled out by your staff or yourself. Again, talking in concentric circles, it's imperative that that membrane be passively placed and it must remain intact for at least six weeks. The epithelium will grow over the top of it. So my suturing technique is very simple. I will take my reverse cutting needle from crest to the facial aspect. Now I can actually see this needle, the curvature of that needle go on top of a membrane if I had a membrane in this situation. I will then reverse the needle and go from crest to palatal or, or lingual in this situation. And I will do several interrupted sutures to hold that graft material in place. Initially, the, the material will be radiolucent, but here uh, on the right, you can see in a very short three months, I can take a digital radiograph and objectively see a change in the bone morphology. Physiologically, bone is going to mature from the apex towards the crest of the ridge. It's physiologic. So I expect more maturity 
of our grafted site at the apical third and less on the coronal portion. When I place my implant, my initial stability with my implant or initial torque is from the apical two millimeters of, of any implant. So I have bone, more bone um, uh, conformity in the apical portion and I can get initial stability. So let's look at a CBCT analysis. Um, we extracted the tooth, we grafted, I can draw out the nerve. Obviously I want to ensure that I am not um, um, uh, damaging the nerve, I, I always like to say at least two millimeters from the superior portion of the alveolar, um, uh, superior, uh, sub, the alveolar canal. And I can virtually design my implant. I can virtually design the placement of the implant and the final crown. And I can use this as an education tool for my patients. So our surgical design, we have a site after three months, we draw out the mandibular nerve, we can virtually place our implant, virtually design our crown, idealizing the position of the implant. Not necessarily doing a guided surgery, that implant needs to go in one spot, but it is a tool that helps me explain to the patient first virtually, knowing my position, my angulation, the amount of available bone, the density of the available, available bone. So after three months of integration of my graft site, more maturity in the apical third, less maturity in the coronal portion, I will then evaluate the site. Is this a site for a dental implant, a single dental implant? Is that the best approach? Do we have a band of attached gingiva on the facial aspect of the implant? Where is our mucogingival line? Those things have to be considered in great detail. I am going to make an incision here. I'm using an Orban knife. Again, respecting a band of attached gingiva on the facial aspect of my implant. I can clearly see my mucogingival line and I'm going to go back to my envelope reflection. And I want you to visualize what we routinely see. We have a bone formation in that previously grafted site. And remember, we had a cereal bowl there. We had a tremendously large defect that I filled in with a alloplastic material, calcium apatite in a bovine Achilles tendon matrix. We can idealize the placement of the implant. Now, I do a lot of histology. I don't want to take a lot of time. I'm not a histologist, uh, but I did a core sample. And remember, we had a big soup bowl there. Um, and the histologic core sample will demonstrate a couple things. Number one, at the apex of that core is bone. The magenta colored material is bone turnover. The violet color or the light purple or bluish color is the graft material, the alloplastic material itself. It will take up to a year for bone to mature completely. I radiographically objectively determined that I had adequate turnover in a short three months, and I feel very comfortable placing my implant at this juncture. So using here, we're using the Han implant system. Uh, doesn't really matter. Every system um, has similar capabilities. We start with a, um, a thinner uh, burr. We go to osteotomy burrs. I want to place this implant right at the crest. Evaluating the bone. And then I'm going to widen the osteotomy here with a 3.5 diameter tapered uh, osteotomy burr to the crest. Continuing to a 4.3 diameter osteotomy burr. I drill at 800 RPMs with copious amounts of water, stopping with the widest portion of that tapered uh, osteotomy burr at the crest. Then finally going to a 5.0 diameter osteotomy burr, again, to the crest. I'm simply going to then thread my implant into position this is the Han implant system. We do have a one millimeter machine collar and there is a bevel. I want that machine collar to be at the crest. So we can clearly see that we have an implant placed to the crest of the ridge. 
And I was actually able to torque it to 45 Newton centimeters. Now think about that, doctor. We had a soup bowl, cereal bowl, grafted three months later, I'm able to get initial stability to 45 Newton centimeters of bone turnover, very simply, very easily, very predictably. Because I was able to get to at least 25 Newton centimeters of torque, I'm going to put a three millimeter healing abutment. This is referred to as a one stage surgical procedure. Uh, what that means, and I will congratulate my patients at that time and says, hey, you know what? Everything healed so well, you did so well that we're able to do two surgeries in one. And the patients will go, huh? Um, I'm able to place the implant and went in so well that I'm able to put a taller screw through the um, epithelial tissue which will allow the tissue to form a cuff. And what that means to the patient is no more injections, no more shots. The healing abutment is placed at the crest of the ridge or at the crest of the epithelium. And I'm simply, we're gonna to torque that to 25 Newton centimeters. And we are going to place a couple interrupted sutures. Now this is a very important photograph here in that you can clearly see that I have a significant band of attached gingiva on the facial aspect of that healing abutment. This is important for long-term stability of the implant. We all know, we've all seen cases where a patient comes to our office, they have an implant in a crown, and they go, you know, it's just sore, it just doesn't feel right. We take a radiograph, the implant looks fine, um, the, the abutment looks fine, the final crown looks fine, but we must recognize that we require a band of attached gingiva of at least two millimeters on the facial aspect of each implant. We take a radiograph. I'm using the apices and my adjacent teeth as my guide as far as depth goes. The width is determined by the uh, horizontal width of the uh, available site. I prefer to place an implant uh, diameter one half the size of the implant I'm trying to replace. So if I have a 10 millimeter space mesial distal, ideally engineering wise, I'd like to put a five millimeter uh, diameter implant in that site. The limiting factor is always the facial lingual in this situation. Um, three months post-op, we allowed this implant to integrate for an additional three months. The graft material is going to continue to integrate and change over. I remove the healing abutment and you can clearly see the healthy cuff of epithelium around it. You can clearly see that there is a definite significant band of attached gingiva on the facial aspect of the implant. And we basically have typodont tissue. I will then have the, take an impression, the laboratory will fabricate in this situation, a screw retained uh, zirconia or Bruxer crown. This is a seating jig that will allow me to torque the implant to 35 Newton centimeters. I can then cover the access hole with Teflon and composite. And we are able to restore form and function um, occlusion to the patient in a very predictable, method. Proper occlusion. Whenever we have a metal to metal component, I suggest that you take a radiograph. You can see that the internal design of the crown is inside the implant. We refer to that as platform switching. Um, so we're trying to, to trick the body or trick the bone into um, not knowing where that micro gap, where the uh, crown and abutment um, fit into the implant. Dr. Hahn created a bevel in that area and we get great predictability using the Hahn implant system um, and great bone health and long-term stability. So let's look at this transition from design to completion. We had a tooth, we removed it, we grafted the site, we virtually designed our implant, we know what size, we know exactly the position, we understand the lingual concavity, we understand the facial plate. We want at least a millimeter, up to two millimeters of facial and, and lingual bone in this situation. Here is a post-operative CT of the actual implant. So from virtual design, morphing into the final implant position, knowing that we got our initial stability in the apical two millimeters, we allow that implant to integrate for a period of time, understanding vital anatomy clearly, 
away from the mandibular canal and mandibular nerve, and we're able to provide a patient uh, an outstanding functional and aesthetic result, creating emergence profile. Aesthetics today are, are outcome-based. Both dental and gingival aesthetics act together to provide a smile with harmony and balance. A defect in the surrounding tissue can be compensated by the quality of dental restoration. What does that mean? If we're able to atraumatically or minimally traumatically remove a tooth and we're able to maintain interceptal bone, we will have uh, interdental papilla in the final restoration. If we damage that interceptal bone or that interceptal bone is, is not there for a number of reasons, we can't expect to have interdental papilla which means we are compromising the final aesthetics with our laboratory procedures. So where do I ultimately want to place implants? Facial, lingually, I want at least minimally a millimeter of facial or lingual bone. Doctors, I can tell you after placing over 18,000 implants, my mistakes, my problems are because I place my implants too far facial. So to making a reflection, seeing the available bone, idealizing the position, using technology to your advantage. Um, I was always trained, visualize the case finish before you ever start. But that is, that is a skill that takes tremendous amount of experience. It maybe took me 10 years to master that. But in today's technology, using um, our, our uh, artificial intelligence, using our CBCT analysis and our, our design software, uh, we are pretty much equals. We can virtually, designed, place the implants prior to any surgical intervention. Mesial distally, we can be no closer than two millimeters with our implant from the natural PDL, and implants must be at least three millimeters. Uh, we must have at least three millimeters between implants because there's no viable blood supply. The papilla level around single tooth implant restorations is mostly related to the bone level adjacent to the teeth and more specifically to the bone crest. So that's why it's so imperative that we not damage or lose interceptal bone. Peri-implant remodeling occurs both vertically and horizontally once the implant is exposed to the oral cavity. Many of us have experienced that. We, we place an implant, we bury it, we see really nice bone healing around it, we expose it, we make our impressions, either virt uh, digital or analog, and we restore, then we start seeing bone loss. We used to say, well, bone loss to the first three threads was not unusual. We expected a millimeter to a millimeter of, of bone loss in the first year. We try to compensate that with the, with the concept of platform switching that I described earlier. Bone remodeling occurs to accommodate the formation of the biologic width. What's biologic width? Biologic width around teeth consists of a junctional epithelium and connective tissue attachment. But doctors, there's no periodontal ligament around implants. So the biologic width with respect to implants is the distance between the most apical attachment of the soft tissue complex and the abutment implant interface. So let's look at this contact dimension. This is from Dr. Tarnow, um, a brilliant uh, educator. And I want you to focus on the, the contact uh, space between the two central incisors, 4.2 millimeters. That is an average uh, contact dimension between the two central incisors. Here we have a patient that presented to me, um, obviously trauma at an early age, um, root canal treated uh, treatment done, uh, really heroics. The patient was so apprehensive, was so careful uh, about, these, about these teeth um, and obviously needed something uh, more permanent. What do we do? Obviously, the patient can continue the way they are. We could take the teeth out and make a, a partial denture. We could uh, prepare the adjacent teeth. Would we want to do a bridge from seven to 10, lateral to lateral? Would we go cuspid to cuspid? These are all options. But in today's environment, obviously, dental implants is a viable option. So let's evaluate our CBCT. Is this a case that we even want to do? Is this a case within your wheelhouse? So we evaluate the CBCT, the sagittal view. We can see the um, maxillary left central incisor has significant bone loss. I want you to really understand the, the anatomy in the premaxillary area. 
the bone is not straight up and down, nor do we want to place the implant directly into the socket. The facial plate is either very thin, fingernail thin, or non-existent. So our implant position is critical to, to um, the final restoration. We will not put that implant directly into the socket site because we will get a dehiscence in that area. And we've all seen that. So let's look at our virtual design. We have a tooth. We're going to extract the tooth. Then we're going to decide where we want to place that implant. The implant will be placed three millimeters palatal to the facial aspect of the adjacent teeth, utilizing the viable bone in that area. The, the other central incisor, we're removing the tooth, significant defect, some facial bone loss. And again, we want to virtually design the implant. Now, whether you do this guided or freehand, I'm gonna leave that up to you, uh, but the implant needs to go into a certain position. So we can then determine if we can idealize the placement of the implant in the premaxillary area, are we able to functionally design fairly aesthetic crowns? Now, without interceptal bone, we don't expect to get interdental papilla, so the teeth may be a little bit more square than we, uh, we would ideally like, but we have compromises uh, throughout, um, throughout our, our techniques. So here's our patient uh, with very square teeth, uh, very limited um, interdental papilla uh, between the central incisors. We are going to a, traumatically or minimally, minimally traumatically remove these teeth. We're going to take a, we're going to use uh, anesthesia. I'm going to just do um, uh, infiltration and a palatal. Evaluating our anesthesia. And here I'm using what, what's referred to as a physics forcep. You may or may not be aware of this. Uh, I won't go into too much detail with this other than uh, it's an instru instrument that uh, was was designed uh, and created by a dentist in Detroit area. I'm very proud to call him a friend, Dr. Richard Golden. Uh, it's a set of four instruments. They're not really expensive. It consists of two components, a shovel-shaped beak, which is the working end of the instrument. It will engage the two surface on the palatal in this situation, uh, one to three millimeters subgingival. The second component we refer to as a bumper. It is placed as high up the vestibule as possible, and the green covering is simply a, a silicone uh, cushioning area. It is not intended uh, to hold the facial plate. It is not the working end of the instrument. Rather, the, the bumper is simply a um, fulcrum point, a center of rotation, which will allow this very precisely designed, uh, the, the curvature of this precisely designed instrument to, to luxate this tooth up and out of the socket without any force. We are simply rotating the wrist towards the, the nose with continuous pressure. The tension created on the palatal surface of this tooth will result in a physiologic release of an enzyme, which will break down the periodontal ligament, which will allow us to, to dislodge this tooth up and out of the socket in a matter of seconds. So there's no force, there's no squeezing. The patients really are not aware of the, of the tooth extraction procedure. And I'm simply rotating my wrist with constant pressure. The tooth will disengage or pop. You won't hear it pop, but it'll disengage. And then I will take what I refer to as a tooth delivery instrument and remove the, what's, rem what's, what's remaining of the, of the tooth. I will then take the second tooth out. Now, what do we do at this juncture? It's very important that we evaluate the facial bone. As I've mentioned earlier, that my mistakes, our problems with implant dentistry is we place the implants too far facial. We've seen the gray shadows, we've seen threads exposed. And in the aesthetic zone, this is critical. This is very important that we create emergence profile and smile design, especially in the aesthetic uh, zone with, with uh, patients that are smiling um, with a pretty high smile line. So I'm going to use the same technique I used before. I'm going to evaluate the site, curette, 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 any granulation, take a radiograph, make sure there's no root fragments left. 
and I'm going to take my Orban knife, which is a specially shaped blade. I'm going to make my envelope reflection, not making vertical incisions, not incising into mucosa so that I do not get the prostaglandin and histamine release. I'm then going to reflect the site and you must feel comfortable reflecting. You must be aggressive, but again, I'm not making any vertical incisions. I need to see the entire defect. If we are going to use a membrane in these situations, I must extend beyond the defect and I must place my uh, barrier, my membrane passively at least two millimeters beyond that defect. I'm curetting the site, curette, 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 removing any granulation tissue from the defect. We clearly see we do not have a facial plate in the um, left central incisor area. When I have a defect beyond five millimeters, I am then going to use an allograft material. This is from Newport Biologics. It's cortical cancellous, um, de uh, mineralized uh, graft material. I will wet it with sterile water, sterile saline, um, if you, if you have the ability to draw blood PRF, you can make sticky bone PRP, um, obviously will, will increase the turnover, but here I just use sterile water to wet it. Do not use anesthetic. Anesthetic has pH of two and it will inhibit. So any of you have ever done grafting, understanding the principles and use anesthetic in your graft, uh, wetting. Uh, and found that the graft didn't integrate, that's why. Do not use anesthetic. So we're simply wetting it and it will create a paste. I am then taking a resorbable membrane. Again, this membrane is from Newport Biologics. It is a resorbable membrane, a long acting resorbable membrane, three to four months. It will be placed passively at least two millimeters beyond the defect onto the palatal and it will protect that graft material from invagination of epithelium. Before I do that, I'm going to do my osteotomies. Um, and I want to make my osteotomy not into the socket site. That facial plate is very thin. Rather, I'm going to make my initial penetration with a 2.4 diameter pilot burr, three millimeters palatal to the facial aspect of the adjacent teeth, engaging the palatal bone structure and going deep enough. Remember where we get our initial stability in the apical two millimeters respecting that facial plate, but placing that implant three millimeters palatal to the facial aspect of the adjacent teeth. I'm going to widen the osteotomy. I'm going to check. Now, this is very important. Doctors, I want you to visualize what the crown is going to look like before we do anything. And you have that ability to visualize the case finish. Placing this spark plug in the jaw is not the hardest thing but understanding emergence profile and smile design is critical. I'm then going to widen the osteotomy. When we do an immediate extraction site, I want my implant to rest one millimeter subcrestal. When I have a, a complete healthy um, uh, edentulous space, my implant will end up at the crest. But an immediate extraction site, immediate placement of an implant, I want that implant to be about a millimeter subcrestal because physiologically, we expect to get some bone loss due to the trauma. Here, I'm widening the osteotomy here with a 4.3 diameter burr. And again, I'm constantly taking radiographs to measure, to know exactly the position. I'm visualizing the emergence of a final crown. I use the apices of the adjacent teeth as my guide. Try not to go any longer than the apices of the adjacent teeth. These are safety nets that are going to make your implant surgical procedures very predictable. I'm then placing my implant and I was able to torque to 45 Newton centimeters in a socket site because I engaged the palatal wall and I extended at least two millimeters uh, apical to the socket site. We place our second implant. Now remember in the uh, maxillary left central incisor, I had a significant facial defect. I'm putting cover screws and I'm evaluating the facial defect. My threads are actually exposed in the um, uh, maxillary left central incisor. I will then graft that defect. 
But first I will place my resorbable membrane. Look, no hands. It's very passively placed. I'm not tucking, I'm not forcing. I can clearly see that this membrane is placed beyond the defect. I'm then taking my allograft and placing it onto the facial aspect of the implant, knowing that that membrane has become my facial wall. I will then uh, lay that membrane onto the um, palatal surface, laying it passively, and I will suture the site. Again, my suture techniques are I always identical. Reverse cutting needle, I'm going from crest to facial, reversing the needle, going from crest to palatal, and again, closing the, the, the space with interrupted sutures, getting closure. I do not care about primary closure. I'm not concerned with primary closure. I'm concerned with a band of attached gingiva on the facial aspect. I'm concerned about maintaining the interceptal bone so I can have some semblance of interdental papilla at some point. Epithelium is going to grow a half a millimeter to a millimeter a day. I will see this patient in one week to remove the sutures and I expect near primary closure and it's physiologic. Because I did not incise into mucosa, I do not uh, expect the patients to experience a lot of discomfort. Obviously we took the teeth out. I think the anxiety of those procedures of actually losing the emotional feelings of losing your two front teeth is much more significant than the post-operative discomfort. Because we did have a little infection there, I personally will use amoxicillin 500 milligrams three times a day for three days. That's all I use routinely. Um, if I can start the night before, I would prefer to do that. If it's an emergency patient, I will start the day of. The patient has a flipper appliance, a removable appliance that is not pushing onto the body of the implant itself. We have soft tissue there. We protect it. I will allow that site to heal for three months, maybe four months in the maxillary bone, depending on the, the, um, the quality of the bone that's available. After three months, I'm going to, or four months, I'm going to expose that those cover screws, make my final impression and fabricate the final prosthesis. We uncover, we place healing abutments and you can see the tissue is magnificent. We get tissue cuffs formed. We clearly have a band of attached gingiva. I will then fabricate in this situation, a custom titanium abutments. My margins are very consistent at or slightly subgingival. Before, and we were able to restore the patients um, to some semblance of aesthetics. Personally, I think we could have done a little bit better uh, with, the, with the shading, but the patient was so thrilled, she would not let me uh, touch these uh, post-placement. Um, and she's been a very loyal and happy patient for a long time. So let's look at that transition. We had two teeth that were non-restorable. We atraumatically or minimally traumatically remove them. We virtually placed our implants knowing size and shape and length of implant that we want to use. We can demonstrate this to the patient. We virtually place the implants. We can virtually design the final prostheses. So we're basically going to know exactly what the final result will be prior to any surgical intervention. You can work with a quality laboratory who will understand these processes to maximize the aesthetic prior to any surgical intervention. The implants are not placed in the socket. These are very important uh, sagittal views of our CBCT. We're engaging viable bone. We got initial stability. And look at the maxillary left central incisor area. Doctors, you will grow a facial plate using this technique. No shortcuts, follow the recipe, and you will grow a facial plate predictably. So let's look at a full mouth reconstruction. Uh, we're gonna take teeth out, we're gonna graft, and we're gonna immediately place implants, and we're gonna do implant retained uh, prostheses. We have a patient that is relatively young, has had a lot of dentistry, 
a lot of dentistry that has failed over the years. The patient is uncomfortable, periodontal disease, um, bleeding, understands that we have to consider uh, a better option. So we're going to remove the teeth. I'm going to contour the hard tissue. Now, oftentimes we will do uh, guided surgical procedures. We will do a bone reduction guide first and then a guided surgery. The all on X concept obviously is very, very uh, popular today. Um, to do that, we need certain amount of interocclusal space 14 to 16 millimeters to be able to load implants immediately or load some type of transitional appliance. We must get initial torque of each of those implants at least to 35 newton centimeters. But if we have situations where the bone quality and quantity isn't adequate, oftentimes we will not immediately place a transitional implant retained prosthesis but rather I will have a printed conventional denture for the patient to wear. I always do that as a safety net because I never know exactly what my initial torque and initial stability of the implants will be. We place their implants. We have healing abutments. Um, those implants that we were able to torque to at least 25 newton centimeters. I'll put healing abutments here. I had implants that I was not able to get that torque, so we, we buried them. This is one week post-op. The tissue heals miraculously. We will then, after integration, again, the patient in this situation wore uh, printed dentures uh, for the healing period. And then we go through the process of fabricating the final prosthesis. And we would do this no matter what, whether we had an immediate transitional appliance, um, plastic or composite, we will do a uh, bite rim, we will set denture teeth, uh, we will take a final impression. Um, now the techniques obviously are changing dramatically, uh, but the technique here is we did impression jigs so that each each implant, each multi-unit abutment uh, has a jig. We will loot them together and I will take an analog final impression, which is very, very accurate. The implants will heal, will integrate. Here is our jigs that we will uh, loot together and take a final impression, fabricating a final impression, fabricating master cast. Our uh, multi-unit abutments are covered with comfort caps. We will reline their existing printed denture. We will then make, uh, we will take time and make provisionals. These are uh, PMMAs, um, um, smile composers, um, acrylic composite restorations. I will let the patient wear these for a time period and let them evaluate it with their families. Um, I want them to be crit critical. I want them to critique it. Size, shape. Now, obviously the acrylic, we want these teeth to be a little bit more separate and distinct looking, but it allows our, our patients to evaluate the aesthetics prior to making the final zirconia or Bruxer implant retained prostheses. Once the patient accepts, and sometimes I do two or three of these, but once the patients accept, uh, the uh, aesthetics, we can see we have health in the area. We will then evaluate and finalize the final prostheses for these patients. Screw retained prostheses and improving the quality of life of your patients dramatically. The critical point of the entire program today is being able to remove teeth, with minimal trauma to the bone, to the patient, and to your body, idealizing the importance of building bone, filling gaps, providing good positioning of our implants, maximizing the final contours, and providing an outstanding functional and aesthetic result for our patients. Final case, uh, a very traumatic uh, fractured, vertical fractured tooth. How would you handle this in your practice? Well, we remove the tooth and I could clearly see the Snyderian membrane. 
We did not perforate the Snyderian membrane, but the distal aspect of this huge defect. Um, I will then take my osteogen alloplastic material. It has consistency to it. And I was what I was doing was pushing that Schneiderian membrane. I can predictably move that Schneiderian membrane about six millimeters. And I like this, this material to do that because it has substance rather than just using an allograft material. When I have a tremendous defect, I'm then going to repair it with allograft, kind of doing a uh, sandwich approach, filling that gap. Now, if I use an allograft, I must protect it from invagination of epithelium, and I will use a resorbable membrane, passively placed at least two millimeters beyond the defect. Doing the surgical, the suturing technique that I demonstrated, I like to use PGA or, or poly polyglycolic acid suture, that's me. Uh, it resorbs to, to water in about 28 days, but I always see my patients in a week to remove sutures. My suturing technique is very uh, consistent, crest to facial, crest to palatal. I don't care about primary closure, rather I'm looking at the band of attached gingiva, my mucogingival line. Post-operative CBCT for education, you can see I went from a huge defect to having 11 millimeters of height in the two areas. One week post-op, I don't have complete closure, but the patient is 85, 90% closed. The epithelium will continue to, to, to grow over a period of time. In another week or so, I expect complete closure. Three months post-op, in a short three months, we now have a surgical site that will accept an implant. Our graft material is adequate for me to surgically place implants. So let's do a reflection there. Please ignore the, the anterior tooth. This was a referral case and the referring doctor will fabricate a crown in the anterior, um, in the forward uh, bicuspid tooth. I wanna show you what we see after three months. Doctors, we have hard bone structure. This is physiologic and we expect it routinely as long as you follow the recipe understand the importance of the material that you're using and the importance of protecting the, the graft from invagination of epithelium. Use high quality products. I'm gonna use do my osteotomies, thin burr, wider burr, widening the osteotomy, widening the osteotomy to the crest, widening the osteotomy, following those rules that I've given you as far as implant position, the implants are placed to the crest of the ridge. I will then parallel the second implant to the first. You can harvest this autogenous bone and use it to repair any small defects that you may experience. And if you use this autogenous bone, you don't need a membrane. We're going to place our second implant. I'm just going to bury it. And you can see the implants will heal for another four months before I start to restore them. And again, you can see the position of the implant following the rules that we've given you throughout this program, lifting the, the sinus floor, the sinuses are clear, and we're able to provide a tremendous service for your patients. Thank you for listening to me today. I hope this was helpful. I know it's a very quick instructional um, education uh, program, but this works for me every day in my practice. And I want to leave you with save your body. Atraumatically or minimally traumatically removing teeth is important. Know how to graft. I use two graft materials, an alloplastic material, osteogen, allo, allo graft material, um, cortical cancellous, demineralized bone. I use one membrane, one resorbable membrane, three to four months. I need it to remain intact for at least six weeks. So three to four months is longer than six weeks. I want to place that membrane at least two millimeters beyond any defect. I want to maintain a millimeter minimally. I'd like to have two millimeters facial, palatal, facial, lingual for every implant situation. And remember, you must have attached gingiva on the facial aspect of your implant. Following this recipe will give you uh, tr tremendous confidence and competence and will give you proficiency as you become very efficient in your dental implant experiences. Thank you so much. Enjoy and be safe.